So this is Sifu David Ross, and welcome once again to the Lions Roar podcast. Um, sort of like I, I already said, sort of a continuing trend talking about um, the history of Chinese martial arts and development and um, the implications particularly for um, today when we look at whether Chinese martial arts are still practical, applicable, um, and you know what their relevance is in a modern society. So um, I'm in the process of working on the second history, the volume two of the, of the history books. Um, you know, I did volume one, which is sort of a general outline. The second one will be sort of more, uh, each chapter will be devoted to a topic. But um, what I'm going to sort of get around to is that um, we have sort of, a, I don't know if they're bell curves, I don't know the proper way to completely explain it, but for example, um, one of the easy ways to, to deal with um, the history, um, at least to, to sort of enter into the discussion, is talk about um, pre-boxer uprising and post-boxer uprising. And it's a little more complicated than that, but um, we talk about before the boxer. The boxer uprising is sort of also the period when we say that. It's the same period that the New Culture Movement showed up. It's the same period with, you know, uh, leads into the period where there's a rising nationalism. Um, you know, uh, it was the point at which it either had to change or cease to exist. So we have what, you know, what was Chinese martial arts before the Boxer Rebellion? Um, before, uh, you know, uh, it, it was um, uh, kind of kidnapped by, uh, you know, basically the equivalent of religious fanatics, um, you know, uneducated peasants that thought, you know, the people that told the uneducated peasants that they would become possessed by spirits and be able to do Kung Fu, you know, um, before people, you know, that led to people totally dismissing Chinese martial arts as irrelevant and, you know, superstitious peasants that, you know, got the country in worse trouble and can't fight anyway, before and after. Um, what's also interesting is, um, I guess the good term is brain drain. I don't know if you guys have heard this term before. They used to say that, you know, um, for example, not now, but in the past, you know, people that were very intelligent in other countries would come to the United States for an education, and then they would stay here and they would work here. And so the brain, in other words, the people that are very, very intelligent and skilled, that country would lose those citizens because they would leave their country, and instead of contributing to their country, they would contribute to the United States because they would stay here and get a job and work here. Um, we kind of had the re like a trickle down and then a brain drain, so it sort of became, uh, you know, again like a bell curve to a certain extent. What do I mean by that? Well, Chinese martial arts were originally battlefield training, um, staves, spears, lances, swords, close quarters, drilling, and what happened was people would get this training, and you know, either being in, a, in an army unit or being a military man, and then they would go back to villages, local villages, and uh, the local villages would need militia not only to defend themselves from bandits, but also to engage in, like, you know, local disputes, and to a certain extent also as recreation in rural communities. In other words, when the, the fields didn't have to be, uh, you know, tended to, um, ways to keep people occupied and particularly youth to try to also as a social pressure valve to kind of release it so martial arts originally were military and then they trickled down into the civilian population and you know then they developed and by the you know beginning of the so in the song we begin to see the beginnings of the formations um but then by the ming we start having you know um the real schools in other words in, in the song they talked about techniques and weapons but they didn't really have established schools. By the time you start the Ming, you start seeing schools, which represent not a single weapon or a single technique, but like a collection of teachings, what we would think of now as a system. In other words, if I think about Honga, I think about the handsets, I think about the weapon sets, I think about the Qigong that goes with it, I think about the training methods. Um, we start to see this in the Ming and the, in the Qing. Then, of course, in the late Ming, early Qing, it gets fused together with some elements of what they call Dao Yin, which was, uh, you know, Taoist gymnastics. Um, and um, I would argue, and in fact argued in my first book, that becomes the slippery slope because you let in sort of a pseudo-religious, pseudo-superstitious 
um, tradition into the martial arts and they became more and more um, pseudo-religious, pseudo-superstitious to the point that, um, you know, like I said, you can have the boxers, which is basically were not martial arts people. They were not really real boxers, you know, in the term that we use, you know, twin now for, you know, that, that was used twin. You know, what we think of as boxers now, which is martial arts people, what the term twin meant before that, which was, you know, people doing martial arts. They were not that. They were people that thought they would be able to fight once they were possessed by spirits. So, of course, after that, and again, you know, um, people try to, uh, you know, make, like I said, the martial arts still relevant. Pardon me. And um, in the process of trying to make the martial arts relevant, you know, the question is, well, are they fighting arts? Are they just physical culture and stuff? Um, but, you know, especially after the May 4th, which is a nationalist movement, which leads right into the, the Koshu, you know, Central Koshu Academy and, and the nationalist program, um, you know, let's, let's recover the traditional fighting aspects and use this to make a, you know, in their particular case, they wanted to militarize the nation so that they could stand up and defend the nation, you know, after the years of humiliation, not just the quote-unquote sick man of Asia, but also, you know, the, the, the very real uh, imperialistic oppression you know, other nations, including Japan, you know, um, were, were subjecting China to, or China was subjected to. So, but what's interesting is this is where we start having the drain, because the people that, you know, were real representative, I would say were the real representatives of pre-boxer uprising, um, which were the people that were practicing real martial arts and could fight, became acquired by the government. For like the Central Koshu Institute, um, became acquired for the military, became acquired for the police. So you know, Cheng Dong Cheng is a great example. Um, he was originally what we would call a folk martial artist. Um, there's some controversy regarding that term now because of the way that it's used, and you know, uh, and the the, the the word games that uh, you know, for example, the Chinese Wushu Association plays, especially now with the the Xu Xiao Dong thing and everything. But if you talk about folk martial arts and what you mean by that is martial arts that are not military, they're practiced by the general population. Well, you know, Chang was not born in the army and trained in the army from the moment he was born. He was born in a community and trained with people, um, in his case, you know, Muslim people, the Mosque Street martial arts community, as they refer to it colloquially, um, which is, you know, the, the Muslim martial arts in Hebei. Um, but then he was very quickly, you know, uh, brought into the Central Koshu Institute and from there went on to train military and then went on to train police. Um, my own teacher, Chan Tai-san, my own primary teacher, Chan Tai-san, learned martial arts because he was an orphan. And as an orphan, he stayed in the monastery. He wasn't a monk. I've said that numerous times. He was an orphan and monasteries often took care of orphans and he learned martial arts in a monastery. Um, you know, was definitely what we would, what would be called if you have the correct definition of this a folk martial artist so um, he then became a member of the military so um, you have this brain drain um, with the communists too I mean like I said originally the communists when they were the not the government when they were the agitators in the countryside were willing to um, cooperate with the local martial arts groups because they were local power bases and they were agitators and they were agitators too. Of course, once the communists become part of the government, it's a completely different situation. So, you know, the popular thing now is that the communists just got rid of martial arts and just destroyed it. No, I mean, they were logical, intelligent people. They didn't get to take over the country of China by being morons. I'm sorry to be so direct about it. Um, they acquired the people that could fight, and they put them in the military. Like I said, you know, um, Chan Tai San was originally part of the nationalist military, but he was captured. He was re, quote unquote re-educated in a re-education camp, and then he ended up training the military. He also trained, you know, the Wushu teams, you know, and that was the other thing. Ch Chinese communists kept, and the nationalists did too, but they just never finished the project. They kept what we think of as contemporary Wushu so that you know the population could be healthy 
but you know they under the pretense of the comrades don't fight comrades thing they took out the military and the reason they took out the military was that um, you know they did not want uh, local power bases contending with the government and particularly under the Maoist in the Maoist period you know um, Mao was sort of obsessed with controlling every aspect of the life down to the very very you know individual on the local village level so a lot of control wushu as we understand it is okay for everyone to do to stay healthy and as an intrinsic cultural value but the fighting stuff is going on in the military and the police and that's why you know you see the the military sanda and you see the military china and you see the police china and the police sanda um and what's interesting is you know um Huang and Hong in their book, um, I, I was just talking about the book that I just got in the mail, and I said actually, ironically, it was published in Mandarin in 1997, but it's not available in English until like the last year or so. But I also found some articles about them, and one of the articles they talked about was this um, Sanda, Sancho, Sanda conference. Um, in the video that's on YouTube that we were all kind of congregating around, which sort of started this chain of podcasts they were talking about 79 but it really goes back to I, looking at some notes it goes back to 78 started talking about it in 78 they issued some proclamations in 79 by 80 they started like doing things and, and doing rules and, and, and everything and what's interesting is that Shabu Hawk, who I've talked about numerous times who is a great example of traditional martial arts people that can actually fight was very very involved in this so um What's interesting is in the article that I'm talking about, written by Hong and, and Huang, they say that this thing, and I mentioned this in the discussion on YouTube, was for the quote-unquote local schools and the quote-unquote folk martial arts. In other words, by 78, the folk martial arts, the people that weren't in military, their practical application skills had deteriorated so much that they felt was necessary to do the Sancho quote Sanda program but didn't apply to the military because the military had never left it and if you've met anybody that was in the military through the, the, the 40s, 50s and 60s like Chantai San was they could all fight um, they all practiced fighting there was no restriction on them um, I've said before though you know, up until about 78, 79 if you had anything that said Sancho on it like a book or anything um, I've been told that you can be put in prison because that was considered military stuff. Now, of course, then, you know, after 80, 81, 82, and the, then they started, you know, publishing stuff because it was becoming, again, an open thing. But what's interesting is that it deteriorated so much that they had to do the Sancho thing. In other words, they couldn't just rely on the folk martial arts to do what they had been doing all along. Because, you know, the, the discussion I was having, you know, and like I said, the Chinese Wushu Association problem is that you know, with the Xu Xiaodong thing where he's beating these people up and they have no skills whatsoever, the Chinese Wushu Association answer is, well, folk martial arts, they were never designed for fighting. That's not true. It's not true at all. It's what happened is that folk martial arts deteriorated so much under the yoke of, um, you know, the, the communist program to keep them from having fighting skills. So, but again, it's very separate from the brain drain, you know, which is they took all the people that could fight and let them train the military. And Chao San was, like, for example, somebody that was allowed to train, like, for example, the Futsan Special Forces. They were like a paratrooper group, believe it or not. Um, he was allowed to train them Sanda, you know, or, or, or close quarters combat stuff. But then he would train the Wushu team, and that was, you know, like to teach them how to do Qigong demonstrations and to make sure that, like, for example, the Nanchuan, you know, the South Fist forms, uh, you know, were, were well choreographed and, you know, good performance. And Chao Tai San was able to do both. Most Chinese martial arts people, I would say, the authentic ones, especially in the, let's say, the pre-boxer uprising period, could do both. Because they had to fight for their living, <coughs> but also for their living they had to perform. I've talked about the Zhang Hu influence all the time, which is that they traveled around and uh, had to make money. So they did public performances, whether it was... The public performance itself that Jerry Ray the money or the public performance that attracted people so that they could sell them their um, their herbal medicines or in some cases the public performance which then got people to then sign up for lessons that would be done in you know the villages quote unquote you know 
Twinjong or, you know, uh, <coughs> boxing fields, martial arts, instructional areas. My allergies are killing me, I apologize. Um, so, those people were plucked out of society. I mean, there was already kind of, always those kind of couldn't figure out how to fight people. I mean, you know, when we talk about the late 20s, 28, 29, the late Thai thing starts. We had people that were up on the platform fighting. And the people that were sitting in the stands going, they're not doing it right, but wouldn't fight. Very interesting. I've been going through all these um, accounts of the late Thai fighting. And the thing I noticed was that, you know, like 60 to 70% of the participants were Xing Yi people. And I said, you know, no one represented Tai Chi whatsoever. Which is interesting because some of the big name teachers in Tai Chi were certainly there. But nobody represented Tai Chi on the late time. I found um, at least two examples of people representing the style of Bagua on the late time. So, that's interesting also. Now, of course, a lot of Bagua people also cross train with Ching Yi. And um, as has been pointed out numerous times, Bagua was always something that was taught to people that already had martial arts background to begin with. So, um, it, it's a very different tradition than Tai Chi. So, we we're talking about the brain drain. We we're talking about, you know, the... You know, we used to have this B.C. and A.D. thing, you know, before Common Era. You know, it used to be before Christ, and then that wasn't politically correct. And then, you know, after, you know, the, the, you know, the birth of Christ period. Um, I would say in Chinese martial arts, we have the Boxer Uprising before it and after it. As far as uh, two very different periods with different issues and with, you know, different things going on. And um, the period... Before the Boxer Uprising, we can characterize by the trickle-down of martial arts from the military into the population. And in the post-Boxer um, Rebellion period, we can see the brain drain, which is the people in the folk martial arts that could fight being plucked out and, you know, uh, segregated into the police and the military. And again, by both nationalist and communist groups. So, um... There's a little short uh, discussion I wanted to add here. Um, and as always, I thank you guys for joining in on the podcast. Have a great day.